Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to Two Toe Tags and Metal Reviews and today we're giving you guys a review of the new album from Mental Cruelty titled Zweilicht. So we've listened to this album non-stop throughout the entire week and I'm going to open the floor and say I enjoyed this album. However, I'm going to take a page out of the book of Vile Self and add a BUT, BUT into this equation. I had an issue with this album. Uh oh. What's the issue? I had an issue. And it was something that didn't, it, it kind of bugged me a little bit at the beginning, but as I was listening to this album, I'm like, ah. The breakdowns. Now, I saw some people commenting on our new releases video where we covered this album saying, oh, the breakdowns kind of suck. And I'm just like, do they? I mean, I didn't really see a problem. But then as I listened to this album, I started to find a trend. Now, and I, you know, we talk sometimes a little bit throughout the week, like, hey, what are you thinking of the album? Mm -hmm. And I brought this up to you a little bit, where this band does, like, THE modern deathcore breakdown, which is super duper, like, so much space, growly animal noises, you let the snare ring out, you wait for it, maybe you slow down even, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And it's like... That can be fun sometimes, yeah. but if it happens over and over, it starts to lose luster and it starts to think, it makes you think that it's a really try-hard sounding thing, like we're trying to be the most brutal, yeah, we're trying to get all the views on YouTube, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I counted, like, this album has 10 songs on it total, but for the purposes of looking into this issue, we're going to consider eight, because there's an intro track and an interlude track. They're not fully developed tracks. Right. So out of eight full songs, six of them have this breakdown in it. And just to be clear, it's not the exact same breakdown. It's, it's not, just the style yeah. of breakdown it's, is the same. I know, not a, I know yeah, what he's talking about. It's not about. an actual copy-paste, but it's yeah. the same general thing. Like, every time it would come on, I'd roll my eyes and think, yeah, there this is again. So out of the eight, what songs don't have this breakdown? The only ones that don't are Nordley's and yeah. The Arrogance of Agony. Now, Nordley's does it right. And let's talk about Nordley's, talk which about Nordley's. is the first song that we heard from this album because we reacted to the music video from it. It's a great song. I think it's a great pace breaker, a mid-album break, essentially. And the breakdown at the end is kick-ass. They set up for a great, it pays off great. And I think it's especially even better considering it's a breath of fresh air. The other breakdowns on this album are all pretty much the same sounding breakdown. So to have something else feels great. Like, whoa, yeah, this is badass. This is fresh. This is different. Yeah, so one thing I think makes Norbley stand out is... Most of, most of these songs are in 4-4, four, four, but the breakdowns are in 6-4. Norbley says it the opposite. Norbley's is actually in 6-4 with the breakdown in 4-4. Four, four. So that's one thing that makes it sound different. Also, it has a it's, a... it's the pacing of the song. You mentioned the pacing of the album, but the pacing of the song specifically is just very good. Mm -hmm. And the vocal layering on this song is also exceptional, even in compared to the rest of the album, which does have good vocal layering across the board, but in this song specifically, it just sounds much tighter, it sounds more, it sounds just nicer, especially with that acoustic intro as well, yeah, it adds 100%. that, it adds that, um, it just gives it its own identity, it really makes it stand out, and yeah, the fact that it also doesn't have that kind of standard-ish breakdown in it, and it kind of goes for a little bit more of a, just a heavy, just, I don't know, the breakdown at the end of the song is just heavy, it's sick, um, it's sick, right, so, it does a lot of things to stand out, and yeah, it's a shame that not more songs were like that. Now, the other song that does not have this style of breakdown, The Arrogance of Agony, the main thing that kept coming to me with this song, which is something I, I, I noticed last week when hearing it for the first time, is that the drums in, I guess, the first verse, I wouldn't say, like, I wouldn't hard commit to say it's the first verse because this drum pattern doesn't return later in the song, but it's mm -hmm. a literal, literal copy and paste of the chorus from Born for One Thing by Gojira. Mm. Like a one-to-one. -one. He's playing exactly what Mario played. Which it's not like a huge deal. Whatever. It's a, it's neat, but it's like, oh that's the go that's the save. That's the he literally lifted it right from Mario. Yeah. And you know what? It sounds cool on this album. It sounds like a cool uh standout moment on this album. And it only happens the one time. And it only happens the one time as well, which makes it extra special. So it's like I'm not knocking it for being like, well he just stole from Gojira. I'm just saying Something well, like that's difficult. It's difficult to, it's, it's, to pass yeah. it. Do you judge it because it's, maybe it's an homage? Maybe it's like a little nod to... Yeah, Gojira. maybe he's like, oh, I love Or maybe it's like, I'm going to steal that because I liked it. Like, how, we don't know what the what the motivation behind it was. Maybe it was a fucking shoot coincidence 
That highly doubtful. That would be hilarious because that's a pretty specific sounding rhythm. It you is. Know what I mean? It is. But uh, yeah, it, it's hard to really. How do you judge something like that when you hear something that's almost like verbatim, exactly like something else you've heard? Do you judge it harshly, like it's a copy, or do you judge it like, oh yeah, they gave a little bit of a nod to Gojira, that's pretty cool. Yeah, because it's especially like, it is something I like, you know? It's like, yeah. it's taken from something I already know I like, Yeah. and it, I didn't have a problem with it here. Like, yeah. every time it would come on, I'd stop it like, oh, it's that Gojira thing, and it's like, yeah, that's cool, I like that, and it sounds cool, and especially with the bass, that's the like, solo bass right before it that leads into it, mm -hmm. that's super duper cool. And that leads me into what I like about this album. Every so most of the songs have really cool things about them. Like even the songs that have the Animal Noises Breakdown, which is Obsessus Idea Daimonio, Forgotten Kings, Pest, Mortal Shells, Symphony of a Dying Star, and A Tale of Salt and Light. They have cool things about them. Symphony of a Dying Star has that breakdown. It's still a sick song regardless. One of the best songs I've heard all year. Especially the way that it's built with the title track right before it, this mm. German chanting that builds up this Works fucking so well. ridiculous drum intro, and then BAM! They drop the bomb! Mm -hmm. And it's like, holy shit! Epic proportions yeah. is like this song. It's fucking nuts. Yeah. And another thing to mention, I think last week we mentioned the key change in the song. Yep. It modulates twice. At the end it does a chorus, like already up modulated mm -hmm. and then it modulates again at, like right after that and then they end the song so it wow. actually does it two times yeah it's it's easily still one of the best songs on the album for me too just throw, listening to it for the week still um I, I made a comment last week about it having like kind of a power metal vibe and i still kind of stand by that but i want to kind of slightly retract that statement because the more i listen to it the more the less it sounded like power metal and i was starting to really think about what it actually reminded me of and it reminded me of children of bodom like oh I just, see I see where you're coming it's from. Very, it's very it's very um reminiscent of like old Bodum and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. there's a power metal element in there. I couldn't quite put my finger on what that was. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not sure, but for some reason I keep getting drawn to power metal when listening to this song. But Bodum influence is definitely there, and that's another thing that makes this song stand out and another reason why we're gravitating towards it so much. And yeah, that interlude that comes right before it is just a beautiful chef's kiss to kind of lead into it. Really uh, really like, I guess you can have a hot spot on the album, really, that, mm -hmm. that pairing of tracks. I also think, like, even songs will have small things. Like, Pest, I really like the outro of Pest, how it, they got this groove and then they slowly just fade out. Long fade on that song. Like, yeah. it's a long fade out, you don't really hear that much on the album as well. And I like that the songs have their own unique moments like that. Now, Obsessus uh, Diamonio, the clean vocal section that happens near the end, Fucking sick. The the notes he's hitting, the way his voice sounds, is just awesome. When I hear it, it's just like, yeah, like you get the power from that. And I think mm -hmm. it's great not only that that's another unique point on the album, mm -hmm. but just the way that that's near the end of the song, too, you lead up into that point, it's like, holy shit, like they're starting this album off with a bang. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things on this album, and we knew that when we were going into it from the first impressions. We said, yeah, there's going to be a lot of stuff to comment on here. Um, but I have my issues as well. Um, my issues are more along the lines of similar to your Gojira thing. Is that I keep getting reminded of other bands when I'm listening to this. I keep getting reminded of Demi Gear. I keep getting reminded of Behemoth. I keep getting reminded of Lorna Shore. I keep getting reminded of Cradle of Filth. There's all these bands, Children of Bodom. There's all these bands that I'm being reminded of. And that's something that I personally view as a negative when I'm listening to music. And it's weird negative though, because I still like it. I like all those bands. I like what I'm hearing. But for me, when I'm constantly being reminded of other bands, it makes this band seem less special. It makes them seem less original, less unique. And originality and uniqueness are things we look for when we're reviewing albums. Um, so for example, the songs Pest and um, the last song, The Tale of Salt and Light, are both fine songs. I have no problems with them, but I feel like both of them could have come off the Pain Remains album and been a Lorna Shore song. They both sound like Lorna Shore songs to me. And I know we mentioned this before, and I was like, oh, everybody's comparing to Lorna Shore. It is what it is. That's what it sounds like. So what are, you, what are we supposed to say? That's just what it is. Um, but yeah, the last song, I'm hearing like, I'm hearing Sun Eater in that song. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, I, I can hear that, right? Um, uh, the Ar Arrogance of Agony is probably one of my top songs that rose up throughout the week, but this song reminds me of Cradle of Filth. It's got this, you know, it's got this echo, this echo thing that happens, and there's like a whisper mm. after it. 
Um, I can't pinpoint exactly when Cradle of Filth has done that, but they've done it, and I'm pretty sure more than once. Uh, is it cool? Yes. Do I like it? Yes. Does it sound awesome? Fuck yes. But I've heard it before, and it's like, I feel like they're just kind of taking cool ideas from other artists, borrowing them, and incorporating into their own songs in their own way, which is fine, but again, as a listener, I'm listening and going, mm, eh, eh. It kind of leaves me on a bit of a, a teeter totter. The song I had the most trouble with this week, and maybe you can comment on it if you have any notes, is Mortal Shells. Ooh. This is track number six, and it's the only song that I was really struggling to write notes for, at least for the first, like, two-thirds of the week. Then finally, towards the end of the week, I started going, okay, I'm going to start, you know, doing some timing on it, see if there's any interesting um, time signature changes or anything. And I do a few different things. Like, it's basically in 4-4. There's two breakdowns in this song. First breakdown starts in 6-4, then moves to 4-4. And then the second breakdown is just 4-4. But then in the second breakdown, they play with the tempo. So they start off slow, then they go fast, and they slow it down again. Um, but the thing that stands out the most to me now, and I'm surprised I didn't notice this before, but there's actually clean vocals in this song that are layered with the harsh vocals. Um, and it's a line, he says, I, he says, I wish to conquer this world. And once I heard it, I couldn't unhear it. But I was so surprised that it took me three quarters of the week or two thirds of the week to even notice it was there. And I feel like there's a lot of that kind of stuff on this album. Very subtle stuff. Subtle use of choir. Subtle use of symphonic and orchestral elements um, that aren't super prominent like you would hear in uh, from bands like um, Brand of Sacrifice, for example, where they're a lot more in your face with the orchestral stuff. This is, this is there, but it's a lot more subtle and a lot more brought back, which I appreciate that. I don't want it to be in your face all the time. So... Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a really good sign of a strong album, though. That The fact that you listen to this album nonstop through an entire week, and near the end of the week is when you notice that, you know? And who knows what else, like, I didn't even notice that myself. So I think the reason is because this song kept coming and going. Mm -hmm. Moral Shells, to, in my opinion, is not a strong song. So when I'm listening to the album, I'd be listening to it and I'll, I'll find, like, Nordlees is the song right before it. I'm like, okay, Nordlees is awesome. Um, and there's Violet and Symphony of a Dying Star right after it. That's one of the highlights of the whole album. So Mortal Shells just kind of kept coming and going, and I forced myself to really pay close, close attention to it, and that's when I started picking stuff out. I understand your point, but I also shouldn't have to do that. I should be able to kind of notice these things um, and appreciate things just as on their own. If the song was a stronger song, and I was more gravitated towards it just for being a better song, then I probably would have picked this up a lot sooner. Yeah, like it's the kind of thing that you wish you would have picked up on just from listening to it without having to force yourself to yeah, look I had Yeah, I had to make myself find it, mm -hmm. right? So that, I get your point. It's kind of a, a, an iffy thing, but yeah. I don't you know, know, regarding what you were saying about like how this was reminding you of other bands, I kind of made a note about that a little bit, mentioning that, you know, the riffs with the symphony behind them remind me of early 2000s symphonic black metal where the bands, they had this orchestra, they had all that going, but they were more on the extreme side. Mm -hmm. So what I really like about that with this album is that it's got elements of this kind of old school black metal, but it's still a modern deathcore album. Yeah. So you've got modern deathcore, which is a big pool of like the same thing. Let's be real. We've commented on that a lot with regarding this genre. Yeah. And you have something that's taking all these pieces from the past and kind of bringing them back. Yeah. Which I feel like gives this album a unique spin in a pool of very similar albums and bands. I can see that point as well, but just to counter it a little bit, I feel like there's a lot of bands doing that. There's a lot of bands that are doing a little thing to sound a little different, a little thing here to sound a little different. I mean, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing, but when everybody's doing the same things to sound a little different, <laughs> then like, I mean, Black and Deathcore is relatively new, right? You've had Deathcore for a while, then Black and Deathcore comes along, and now that's relatively new, but there's a lot of bands doing that. Um, I would put this into that category. Mm -hmm. um, but at what point do you now, like, say, oh, Black and Deathcore is kind of just this group thing that everybody's kind of just doing this thing now, right? They're taking elements of this old school orchestral black metal stuff and throwing it into their deathcore and, you know, kind of redefining the genre. It's been done already, right? So they're just kind of beating a dead horse, so to speak. Um, I mean, it still sounds good. That's, I mean, that's the takeaway though. It still sounds good. It's still good music. Mm -hmm. So what are we really complaining about? I think I think at the, bot the end of the day, we're just, um, I might, might sound like we're just trying to look for things to complain about, but we're critiquing an album here. Yeah. Right? That's what we're here to do. We're here to 
to give you guys the pros and cons and tell you guys the strengths and the weaknesses. And I think the fact that it does sound like other things is a weakness. Whether it's a big weakness or a little weakness, I don't know, but um, to me it is. And I think when that happens, it's a very uh, double-edged sword. Because it sometimes, is. you know, a band will sound like these other bands and it, it's cool because it's like, whoa, this reminds me of that, but this is like that evolved. Yeah. But then, but then in other situations, like this case for you, yeah. it just kind of reminds you too much of other things, Yeah. but it's not really doing enough with those elements to, yeah. to push forward for you. Yeah, exactly. And like even people in the comments were saying like one, like I didn't even think of the Behemoth um, comparison until somebody mentioned it and I went, okay, let's check that out. So I listened to it and I go, this fucking sounds like Nergal. Like, I can't remember what song, I don't think I made a note of that specifically, but um, yeah, I was like, I was like, this does sound like Behemoth. Oh, it was, it's the second song, Obsessus, uh, Diomino, yeah. Um, I wrote this, the, the end sounds like Behemoth with Nergal style vocals. So it's like, you know, I get influences, people can influence your music and stuff like that, but I don't know, it is what it is. It's just, that's just how it went, so. Well, I think it's a good time for us to get the ratings. Okay. Uh, this is a tough one. It really is tough. Uh, because I think this is a pretty solid album from beginning to end. I have to decide whether these hang-ups if it sounded like other things is enough to kind of get it off toe tag territory or not. Um, there's also the fact that, you know, a lot of the songs are good, but only I think three or four of them are great. Um, and that's considering that's three or four of them out of technically eight because two of them are like non well, songs. You know what I mean? I mean, track number like the title track is a, is a song. It's an interlude, but it's a song. And I, I, I usually don't like interludes, but this one I liked. I really, I never mm. skipped it once, but I really liked it. I liked the the, the setup to the, tr the the following track. Mm -hmm. It just does such a good job. It's probably one of the best interlude lead up tracks that I've heard in a long time. Um, the beginning track, the mid winter, I skipped this one several times throughout the week because. It was just, it doesn't do much. On a very first listen, sure, sets the tone, sets the atmosphere, sets the album up very nicely. But once you've heard it once, you're like, okay, I don't need it anymore, right? So I'm probably judging this out of nine tracks rather than 10. Um, but I'm looking at my notes here. I'm going one, two, three, four songs out of nine that I really like. Um, two of them went in the playlist. I, I don't think this is a toe tag album for me, unfortunately, but it's a super strong album. It's going to be a 7.5, which sucks. I, I mean, I haven't it's seen not, you get that score in a not while. the first time we've done this yet. It's been a while, but uh, this is right on the doorstep, man. I wish there was another track or two that were stronger, or it reminded me less of other things that I was familiar with. Either one of those things would have put it over to the, ter to tag, to the toe tag territory, <laughs> but... In this case, with those two little elements there, I, I, I can't do it. Sorry. Well, I, I admit, like, this has also been tough for me as well. Especially because sometimes when, when we were, like, we'll sit down and we'll kind of have a rating in our head, right? Yeah. And when we talk about it to each other, we can influence each other. Sometimes we'll influence each other to rate it higher or rate it lower. Yeah. Now, with this album, I enjoyed it just a lot overall. Like, I did have a lot of fun with it. But I was having this hangover with the breakdowns. But then I thought to myself, and I, and I asked myself, what are the problems I have? The breakdown thing. What else? Nothing else, really. Like, I didn't find any other problems with this album other than the breakdown thing. So is this breakdown thing worth denying a toe tag for this album? And the fact that Symphony of a Dying Star is as good as it is and still has the breakdown in it and is one of my favorite songs, is my favorite song from the album, went into my best of the year playlist. So, no, it's gonna get my toe tag. And you know what? When, when it comes to toe tags, to, to remind you in case you guys aren't aware, a toe tag isn't a 10. A toe tag yeah. is an eight, 8.5, nine, nine, from eight to 10, yeah. it can be within that range. So yeah. a toe tag album could be a 10, yeah. or it could just barely get over that hump and be an eight. And I would say for me, this album is an eight, but in our cases, it's a toe tag. Yeah, so. Unfortunately, I couldn't do it. Um, hey, yeah, this one's on the sucks. doorstep. <laughs> it's on the doorstep. It's not the first time this has happened. We've oh, had yeah. albums like this before. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it just it just didn't quite make it for me, unfortunately. So I'm sorry, Mental Cruelty, if you're watching this video. <laughs> anyway, Maybe guys, next time. <laughs> that's all we got for you today. A 7.5 from Vile Self and a toe tag from myself. And remember, 
to comment on the video. Tell us what you think of this album a week after its release. Subscribe if you guys are new to the channel. Like this video if you liked it. I'm TV Fish. I'm Bile Self. And keep the horns up.